by way of preface, I, I mean, I don't know whether some of, we've known each other for a long time in, in my, in, with many of you. Uh, before I came to UNE, when I was in graduate school, I, I taught in a maximum security prison for three years. And, uh, and I, it was a very formative experience for me. And I got to know and think very deeply about the criminal justice system and its failings and its uh, the horrors associated with it. So, you know, so this is part of my thinking and part of the reason I'm so grateful that Colleen is back to the University of New England Center for Global Humanities. So Colleen Aaron, uh, PhD, is an associate professor on the Criminology and Criminal Justice Program Director at William Patterson University, a member of the Crime and Justice Research Alliance of the American Society of Criminology. Aaron is an active contributor to the scholarly community. Her research focuses on white collar crime, crime and media, social and social movements on criminal justice issues. Her latest book, Reform Nation, The First Step Act and the Movement Against Mass, Mass Incarceration, published by Stanford, <laughs> is the first book to look specifically at criminal justice reform as a, as a social movement since its mainstreaming in 2020. She's also the author of Bernie Madoff and the Crisis, the Public Trial of Capitalism, uh, which examined the way in which the high-profile Ponzi scheme allowed the public to discuss the broader economic problems, which led to the financial crisis of 2008. And she also gave a lecture through Zoom remotely on this subject to, at the Center for Global Humanities. She has since, she has been featured in several documentaries about the Madoff case and has been published in the New York Times on the subject. Additionally, Aaron is co-author of the Impact of Supreme Court Cases on U.S. Institutions, a Sociology of Law Primer, uh, published in 2001. Prior to entering academia, Aaron was director of organizing at New Yorkers Against the Death Penalty, which led a successful statewide campaign to end capital punishment. She is vice president of the Board of New Hour for Women and Children, an NGO which assists women re-entering society after incarceration. So please help me welcome Colleen to the podium. So tonight I'm going to be telling you the story of the passage of the First Step Act, which was passed oh, five years ago, almost the day, by Donald Trump on December 21st, uh, 2018 in the very few hours before the government shut down over border security and the wall. Um, it was one very modest criminal justice reform bill, and because it was applied to the federal system, had very little, uh, was limited in its ability to make dramatic incursions into the incarceration rate in the United States, since most incarceration, as probably most of you know, is located at the state level. So, why tell the story of the passage of the First Step Act? So when I first saw, this will make Anwar happy, um, when I first saw the photo of the signing of the First Step Act, I was reminded of the famous sociologist, Arlie Russell Hochschild. In describing her research methods, and by the way, she's written a fantastic book called Strangers in Their Own Land, um, but in describing her research methods, she describes the impetus for research being a little mental itch, something that bothers you. And usually it turns out to be a contradiction of sorts. It turns out to be a conflict. And so I felt this mental itch while looking at this um, remarkable photo and the questions that it presented. The signing of any type of criminal justice reform under President Trump seemed to be a surprise. After all, he had declared himself the law and order president and had advocated for the execution of drug dealers and had given out false homicide statistics. Um, so this, this was a puzzle in itself, but even more interesting was the incongruous group of people, unlikely stakeholders that gathered around the Resolute Disc there during a time of intense political polarization. So you had conservatives like Mike Pence and Ted Cruz and Mike Lee alongside Democrats like Sheldon Whitehouse, the niece of Martin Luther King Jr., uh, conservative and libertarian organizational leaders from Faith and Freedom, coalition from Right on Crime, from the American Conservative Union, alongside those from left-leaning advocacy groups, including from Cut 50, 
and from the Ladies of Hope Ministries. There were representatives of law enforcement from the International Association of Police, from the Fraternal Order of Police. You had a billionaire philanthropist. He's tucked in. You don't see him there, which kind of feels metaphorical, but he's tucked in there. Um, so you had billionaire philanthropists with deep corporate ties. You had Van Jones, who's also tucked in the back there. Um, beyond that, you had people who were formerly incarcerated activists and advocates on both sides of the political spectrum. From the American Conservative Union, you had David Zafavian, who was formerly incarcerated and subsequently pardoned by President Trump. You had Topeka Sam, who was on the left, and she was also pardoned by President Trump. So this was remarkable, but even more remarkable, beyond those who were present uh, be behind the Resolute Desk, Cut50 had established, this organization, an 11-page document which contained supporters of the First Step Act. Among those stakeholder groups were who were contained were businesses and corporations, 50 celebrities, the entire Baltimore Ravens team, corporations, uh, senators about equally distributed on the right and the left who were co-sponsored, celebrities. Um, and so it was this, this remarkable, unlikely group. And so the mental itch was to understand how criminal justice reform, which people, sorry, I'm not looking at anyone. Um, so people older than 20 uh, today <laughs> remember as being political kryptonite that the, it was a hyper punitive social and political milieu specifically in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. Among those who were in advocacy, it was a very niche, balkanized, and siloed type of issue. It was unpopular and unfunded, but it seemed like we had reached, reached some type of a tipping point by the year 2018. So it's important to tell this story. It's important because through its telling as a case study, we can understand on a more macro level the clear changes to the national ethos about crime and punishment that began in the very late 1990s and early 2000s, which also brought about the emergence of an entirely different infrastructure, a truly nationalized and mainstreamed movement with diverse stakeholders across a range of political ideologies. They came together as a coalition for the passage of the First Step Act. And the dynamics that were behind the First Step Act, including the very divisive, polarized fights that happened about what should be in the content of that behind the beautiful veneer of transpartisanship, the activation of the capital by elite participants, the stories, the voices, the media that was used, the demand that was made symbolic through the First Step Act of a change in the movement for criminal justice was also, this was writ large, but it was happening at the level of the states and locally as well. It's secondly important to tell about the passage of the First Step Act because it hints at, it's not only a kumbaya story, my friends. Um, it hints at the limitations but also the possibilities and contradictions, the nuances of movements such as those for criminal justice reform, but of any type of movement. So while tonight I'm going to be focusing on one bill and talking about one movement, we could be talking about many types of movements that happen under conditions of post-democracy and under conditions of philanthropic capitalism which is a movement born in the late 90s that establishes the idea that entrepreneurs are better equipped at solving the problems in society than lumbering government bureaucracies who have failed for so long. So what does it mean that these movements are happening during periods of post-democracy? So I borrow the term post-democracy, it's not my own, from Colin Crouch, who has written two books on the subject. And I'll quote from him, he says, post-democracy is when the real energy of the political system has passed into the hands of a few small overlapping sets of elites, politicians, and the corporate rich, where civil society is essentially moribund, passive, and doesn't have the civic passion to engage in counter-lobbying against those elites. Post-democracy doesn't happen when we've given up on the rule of law or even when we've given up on democracy but rather when there is no civic engagement and when nothing spontaneous can arise in and of itself from the general population. 
In fact, the social movement literature would argue that social movement, this isn't, that what I'm going to describe to you is not a social movement at all because it is primarily composed of institutional actors who are being paid. So what happens when change is being mostly shepherded by institutional actors from the elites within big philanthropy, from the nonprofit industrial complex, from corporate and cultural elites. So this is a larger story about how social and political change are being made, the sustainability of that mode of change and how the change itself, what is the change that it engenders and the future of robust democratic practice. So to begin, I would like to put the First Step Act in some context so you can see, there we go. So you can see how it has the traces of the evolution of the movement against mass incarceration itself since mass incarceration began in the 1970s. So prior to, prior to um, 1968 or beginning in 1968, federal legislation that was passed that was largely um, ramping up incarceration and increasing the punitiveness of sentencing. So for example, some of the previous federal bills that we see beginning in 1968 are the <laughs> omnibus crime um, and safe streets legislation under Lyndon Johnson. You had the Comprehensive Crime, Crime Control Act of 1984 under Reagan, which eliminated federal parole and made insanity defenses more difficult. We can imagine why that happened under Reagan. Um, the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986 and 1988, which instituted long mandatory minimums that for the same types of crimes just extended sentences. And probably everyone here has seen 13th, yes? Um, but the 100 to 1, very infamous 100 to 1 crack cocaine sentencing disparities were implemented under this law. Well, it didn't get better. As we know, there's the infamous 1994 crime bill under Democrat President Clinton. Um, I would like to emphasize at this point that mass incarceration was not the project of the right. Mass incarceration was not the project of Republicans. It was very much a bipartisan project. And so it, there's not really ironic, um, or perhaps it is, that it's a bipartisan project in, dis, in uh, attempts to scale it back in the uh, mid 2000s. So the 1994 crime bill um, expanded massively the ty types of funding for building prisons. It created new categories of crime. It allowed 13 year olds to be waived into adult court. Uh, very significantly for mass incarceration, scaling up sentencing. It provided for um, three strike laws and it increased overall penalties. Clinton also presided over a, a, a further bill that uh, restricted court oversight of prisons because who needs that? So this was criminal justice reform prior to the year 2000. If you read the historical documents discussing criminal justice reform, reform was in the direction of harsher sentencing, harsher conditions in prison, lock them up and throw them away the key, super predators, all, the, all that type of language that was prior to 2000. In 2000, we find this tipping point where all of a sudden mirrored in the same way that the movement mirrored change, there was a shift in federal criminal justice legislation. And so the first president to preside over this shift was George W. Bush. Um, and so George W. Bush signed the uh, Prison La Rape Elimination Act, which uh, obviously dealt with this, the scourge of sexual abuse in prisons. But it also he also passed the Monumental Second Chance Act, which focused on re rehabilitation, reentry, largely used the language of compassion. Um, trying to, to redeem people who had been thrown away and, and locked away. Um, Obama continued this momentum with the Fair Sentencing Act, which finally lowered the crack cocaine disparity to a meager 18 to 1. Still there, but, but it was better. But it was not retroactive. In other words, everyone who was sentenced prior to 2010 still was sentenced under the 100 to 1 disparity. So the First Step Act continued this trajectory, but arguably had much more impact on corrections and sentencing 
policy. This was seen really as, I think looking back, it feels like 100 years ago, I think that if I were to rewrite the book because it's changed since then, I would call this the golden age of criminal justice reform and we're exiting it into, into something else right now. So what did it do? I'm just going to give you, my focus is not on the actual reform, my focus is on the story of how the movement was created and how it relates to post-democracy, but briefly, some of the um, corrections and sentencing policy from a correctional standpoint, it um, ended the shackling of women who were giving birth in prison. Um, it made sanitary products much more widely available to these people in quantities that they needed. It allowed for more teleconferencing time with their families. It brought people closer to their families. Importantly, it allowed people out of prison earlier. So how did they do this? They assessed uh, very controversially using algorithms the risk and likelihood of people to reoffend, and based on these algorithms, people were given are given programming that's appropriate to them. For every 30 days that someone takes programming, they get 10 days off of their sentence until eventually when it adds up to the remainder of the sentence, they're released into um, supervised, supervised release, usually through incarceration, e but is not being in prison. Um, so those were some of the, the changes. It also, from a sentencing perspective, from a non-correctional perspective, it made some incursions uh, into the previous 30 years. How did it do that? Well, first of all, it ended some mandatory minimums for, for drugs, drug sentences, which was very, was very positive. It expanded clemency and compassionate release for those who were sick and dying in prison. Um, and it also eliminated some of the stacking penalties, things that really added up sentences on the basis of um, having possession of a firearm, even if it was an antique, even if it had nothing to do with the crime. So these were all very positive things. And some of the outcomes have been promising. So 30,000 people have been released uh, since 2018 because of the First Step Act. Another 4,000 have been released because of early clemency. Um, so there's early indication that by all accounts, this was a successful act, which was thought to be uh, paltry in 2018, but now seems a little bit incomprehensibly uh, forward thinking, depending on it. So what my book tries to do is to show that the criminal justice reform movement is an example of what happens when a movement is mainstreamed under conditions of uh, post-democracy. Now to have success in any movement, and I'm going to talk about how we come to this position, you need to first have collective acknowledgement that there's something problematic in the first place. Otherwise, why would you have any type of, why would there be a movement if we don't think that there's a problem that's there? There's nothing to solve, nope, no discussion. So you have to have a critical mass of people across the spectrum from a host of different uh, life situations who agree that something is wrong. Secondly, um, you have to have some way of reaching more people. And that's why I call through ideologically relevant uh, resonance stories. So it can't just appeal to the right, it can't just appeal to the left. You have to engage a broader coalition. Um, with a mainstream movement, getting this into ubiquity, uh, resources need to be marshaled, action and amplification, amplification that happens because of these resources, and then you'll see expansion and mainstreamization, a kind of opening of the Overton window, the acceptance of this movement as being part of the mainstream, which then breeds more collective acknowledgement, that then breeds more ideologically relevant stories, and so on and so forth. And I put the arrow, arrows, I'm glad I did, because otherwise I'd have big problems in explaining what a way would happen in 2020. Um, but I put the arrows there to say that this is not by any means a turnstile process. That once we enter this, we could also go back, especially with criminal justice reform, which is so tied to public opinion. So we might have competing concerns beyond, for example, the problem of mass incarceration. There might be the economic concerns. Um, let's say that we think that there is a problem with incarceration. However, there's an alternative story that, that deals with this problem. Well, we have over-incarceration, but the bigger problem is crime. That then puts a halt to the pro progress of a movement to end mass incarceration. We can have action amplification, but what happens when the tactics or the language or the framing of a movement become too controversial? 
you're not going to expand and mainstream in that way. So to begin with the first point, how do we arrive at a period where we have collective acknowledgment? Okay, so I argue we, have, we had a perfect storm in the 2000s to 2020 June. <laughs> so first of all, um, we had sustained, sustained drops in violent and nonviolent crime beginning in the 1990s. Dramatic, historic shifts. Um, Donald Trump tried to argue in 2016 that this, this was, uh, we had the urban, uh, the urban specter of more crime, and he argued homicide rates were at their highest in 40 years, that was wrong, and so it didn't resonate with people. So you can make change happen when crime is not a looming specter. Second, it was an enormously tight labor market. And so this allowed for those who were uh, on the corporate sidelines looking in to see if they, <laughs> they could weigh in on this issue to say, well, it's in ourselves. There was interest convergence too. It's in our interest to have the 70 to 100 million people in the United States who have a criminal arrest record of some kind all of those people who have a record that can impede their ability to get a job, we need to bring, we need to bring them in because we need bodies. Because of, especially the first point, for most voters, there was low salience of crime. It wasn't one of the most frequently asked questions to assess voter opinion on crime is, are you afraid to walk within a one mile uh, radius of your home? If they say yes, that's very bad for criminal justice reform because it hits home, literally. Uh, way too easily. And lastly, around late 1990s, early 2000s, the opioid crisis began to hit white America. Um, many of my conservative participants said that they felt in no uncertain terms that the opioid crisis helped, especially to rally conservatives to the movement because everyone had a brother, a mother, a son, a, someone who, was, who had overdosed, who was caught up in the system because they, um, they had been involved, and they knew that they were not bad people, but they had merely been caught up. And so this created the conditions for collective acknowledgement that something was wrong. That critical mass was affected so that one in three Americans currently has a record of arrest. Because of the mainstreamization, you have two changes that I'm gonna be talking about throughout. One was structural, which has to deal with how the movement itself looked different. Two reasons. Um, the movement became structurally different because organizations that previously, large organizations that did not have criminal justice reform as part of their mission, as part of their work, suddenly adopted this in the 2000s. Just to give you an example, the, um, the American Civil Liberties Union and the American Conservative Union, both of them from the right and the left, uh, formally adopted criminal justice reform as such. Secondly, new organizations sprung up that only focused on criminal justice reform but had a national component, such as Right on Crime, which is very uh, famous on the right, um, and Just Leadership USA on the, on the left that is national in scale. But culturally and normatively, uh, reform began to enter our, our consciousness, um, and I'm going to show a little bit why. So one in three Americans, as I mentioned, you can see I brought this back all the way to 2000, um, excuse me, oh my God, <laughs> 1925, to just make one specific point. The homicide rate in 19, the 1930s was about 10 per 100,000. The homicide rate in the late 1970s was also about 10 per 100,000, and the homicide rate in the 19, early 1990s was about 10 per 100,000. You'll notice that the rate of incarceration did not massively increase after the 1930s. So in other words, it was the response of harsher sentencing, it was the response of corrections being seen as having to have more punishment that led to um, mass incarceration, so that we went from 197,000 people in the 1970s who were incarcerated um, at the state and local level to 1.3 million. Dramatic increase. Just to make a bigger point, this is concerned with correctional impact, correctional footprint 
broadly. That includes probation, prisons and jails, and parole, such that in the current year, we currently have about 5.5 million people under correctional supervision of some, some kind, and it peaked at 7 million people in 2008 at the height of mass incarceration. So how could you not acknowledge with that scale that something was wrong? We may not agree about the direction of where we should go, but there was a problem. Now, how do you reach people? So we all acknowledge there's a problem. I argue in my book that some of the successes of large advocacy groups on the right and the left with criminal justice reform was their ability to speak in transpartisan fashion um, to people who had different ideological beliefs. They weren't coming at it from one, one way or the other, and when they spoke to their constituencies, they used language that was specific to them and didn't try to uh, impose. So I argue that from left-leaning advocacy groups, they prim primarily relied on the exodus story, and from right-leaning groups, they primarily relied on the redemption story. I follow Francesca Paletta here, um, who's a scholar of social movements, and she argues that the arc of stories, the arc of narratives, especially biblical narratives, is one that moves people in social movements, that you have both terrorism <laughs> and you have positive change occur because of these types of good and evil narratives. So from the left, the Exodus story. The Exodus story is one that posits the origins of mass incarceration in the enslavement. This probably will sound familiar for those who uh, uh, abide by more left-leaning um, political beliefs that the origins of mass incarceration and almost anything that's wrong in the United States today comes from the, um, the original sin, if you will, and that's the language they use actually, of enslavement, the enslavement of um, black Americans. And because of this, I'm sure, raise your hand if you read New Jim Crow. Okay, oh, fewer people than, so um, the New Jim Crow set, set records for, um, for it's sitting on the, the top of the New York Times bestseller list. So Michelle Alexander argues in The New Jim Crow that uh, incarceration is just another manifestation, um, rebirth of the same systems of social control that we found in slavery. So slavery to Jim Crow to mass incarceration. So this narrative posits that you have slavery and how do you fix it? Well, you have to be led by one of your own and you have to essentially abolish it. You have to get rid of slavery. So the rise of the term mass incarceration coincided with the Exodus story that was put in the novel, oh, excuse me, in the book uh, by Brian Stevenson, Just Mercy, as well as in Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. And I invite you to look at the uh, graphs that I have here, which are Google trend searches for the term mass incarceration. You'll see that mass incarceration, the, high, the peak of searching for mass incarceration was 2020. So I asked my students, why did this happen? <laughs> and the answer was the pandemic. That wasn't it. <laughs> so the answer was George Floyd, right? And, um, but why were people searching mass incarceration during George Floyd? Because there were, uh, this was a discussion about racial justice and policing. And so the language of mass incarceration was tied to that racial justice, social justice understanding of the problem of criminal justice. So you can see how we're thinking about this as a society. I'll also point to the graph on the right that makes the same point. I personally think that the dip between 2016 and 2017 was because everyone was distracted by Donald Trump. <laughs> and they gave up on everything else. But so this was enormously, this was the language mostly of the left. Um, in my research, I sat in on the Conservative Political Action Conference. Um, I sat in on right on crime discussions and the term mass incarceration is not used because they argue that to use this language makes, it, makes incarceration, the problems with it inherently racialized, which they reject. Just to make the point one more time further, um, this was the related queries for mass incarceration. You'll see that Michelle Alexander's there, um, slavery to mass incarceration, mass incarceration in African Americans. The public consciousness was tied to this intersection of ideas. On the right, on the right, 
is not Exodus. <laughs> um, on the right is redemption. For the right, the idea is that in the, 19, the 1970s, I'm not going to curse. I usually curse on this, but it's being recorded. Um, in the 1970s, we messed up. <laughs> in the 1970s, we messed up. We um, overcompensated. We, we, oh, we exaggerated our response to the war on crimes, to urban unrest, and we put too many people away. We didn't allow space for uh, people to be redeemed because all people are redeemable in the eyes of God through grace. And so many of the leaders in the conservative movement come out of a uh, very Christian perspective in why they became involved in addition to their personal involvement. Over-incarceration, therefore, makes the point that this was a mistake. Because it's a mistake, it can be redeemed. The system can be redeemed at the same time that you redeem the individual. So I'd invite you to look at the left graph, um, which is searches for criminal justice reform which was associated with over-incarceration as a word. And you'll see it peaked in 2018 because these were, uh, this was the language of the First Step Act, which was uh, heavily, heavily uh, advocated for by the right. And criminal justice reform also takes off after the First Step Act. Interesting side note, um, mass incarceration as a term was first used to describe internment of Japanese Americans and since, has, since, since then has completely lost, lost that connotation. To make the point about criminal justice reform and over-incarceration, we'll see has nothing to do with African Americans, nothing to do with slavery, nothing to do with Kamala Harris, nothing to do with Hillary Clinton, nothing to do with, right? It has to do with Trump <laughs> and right-leaning right -leaning narratives. The stakeholder groups that came together, given that you have mainstreamization that happens through collective acknowledgement that's a pro uh, um, that there is a problem, ideologically resonant stories on both the right and the left, the stakeholder groups that came together, I'm going to be describing six that were operating in this milieu, and I, I think that the connection to post-democracy and the complications and the contradictions and the questions that it raises are very provocative. So the first stakeholder group that I would like to tell you the story of their involvement in the First Step Act are billionaires and big philanthropy. The picture that I'm putting up for you to take in is the Reform Alliance, which was founded in 2019 exclusively by billionaires and celebrities. Um, it was allegedly founded by Meek Mill and Michael Rubin. Uh, Michael Rubin is the billionaire owner of the Philadelphia 76ers, and his buddy Meek Mill, as many of you know the story, was caught up in um, uh, over-sentencing over for, for minutia related to violating the conditions of probation and parole. So represented here are, is Jay-Z, Robert Kraft, Michael Rubin, Meek Mill, uh, Michael Novogratz, the billionaire um, crypto investor, Clara Wusai, who's the wife of the Brooklyn Nets owner. Dan Loeb, who is the uh, CEO of Third Point Capital. And of course, Van Jones, who somehow makes an appearance in all of these, all of these. So how were billionaires and big philanthropy involved in the First Step Act that in a way that also ties into how the movement itself has evolved since the early 2000s? I'm going to focus on one involvement because it's an interesting story. So the person that I put up here is Doug Deason. Um, Doug Deason is the son of billionaire Darwin Deason, Texas philanthropist billionaire. Um, and Doug Deason, when he was young and unwise, broke into a friend's house while they were having a raucous party and was subsequently arrested. He went to his parents, as, as he would, and they made some calls to Asa Hutchinson, that really helped. And so he got off, was able to apply for college, had no consequences. And he says that this was a very formative moment for him because he realized that if he didn't have you know, wealthy parents, that if he, he actually says, if I had been a young man of color, I would probably have not gotten into college. It would have been a, a mark on my resume. And so he um, became motivated, especially when the Cokes got involved, to engage in criminal justice reform. He was on the sidelines, though. 
Um, he was originally going to support Ted Cruz for president. But in 2016, here comes Donald Trump. And he, he had one question for Donald Trump. He said, how do you feel about people who have committed crimes? Doug Deason is part of what's called the Dallas Piggy Bank, which controls all, most of the money that flows into Republican politicians. So this was a very weighty question for Trump. So Trump said, I believe that you should not walk around with an F for felon on your forehead for life. And that was good enough for Doug. He said, OK, I'm supporting you. <laughs> so when Trump came into office, Doug was invited to be an ambassador. And Doug said, no, 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 no. I am going to, if, if you want, uh, I would like to work with Jared Kushner. And I would like to work on criminal justice reform. So Jared Kushner's father was incarcerated for a white collar crime and apparently it took some persuasion, but they became a duo within the White House that was focused on criminal justice reform. And Doug was highly motivated and worked with Kushner to gather the uh, inside folks for a private meeting at the White House. He wrote the invitation himself and he said, you're not to talk about money. <laughs> invited the people who would be the backbone of the entire story of the First Step Act. So arguably, the First Step Act would not have occurred without the continued advocacy of Doug Deason, who then goaded Jared Kushner, who then goaded Donald Trump, and Ivanka, I'm sure, had some type of influence on her husband. That's the kind of singular personal story of one billionaire's involvement. Um, all the billionaires that I showed previously on the slide had some type of a role, or most of them did, in the First Step Act, in using their personal political capital to lobby for it. Um, but one of the key changes in the movement post-2000 that's been expressed to, was expressed to me by my participants, the 55 people who, who talked about the movement in my book, was <coughs> the influx of funding that happened post-2000 from uh, big philanthropy. And so, all of the organizations shifted their funding post-2000. Koch was one of the first that was involved. They became involved in um, around 2001. Open Society Foundation also took criminal justice reform as an objective in 2000. And one, Mark Zuckerberg, um, the Justice Accelerate, Accelerator Fund was in 2021, one of the biggest infusions of funding into that area. The Reform Alliance itself has million dollar commitments by all of the people who were represented there. Arnold Ventures became involved. They're one of the biggest players in the space around 2011, 2012. When I spoke tonight, Michael Novogratz, he said that there's around, $600 million currently in the space just from big philanthropy alone. So this was a major shift. However, the shift also was in the nature of philanthropy. That philanthropy went from just being givers to being doers, such that often my participants would say if philanthropy wants something to become a primary objective of uh, the criminal justice reform movement that shifts the entire space, sometimes to the benefit of what they're trying to achieve, sometimes to the detriment if they're getting over their skis. So for example, um, some of my participants said that we were going to receive large amounts of funding to do bail reform, but what if you don't want to do bail reform? What if you want to do something else? You're kind of forced into this position. A key question in a post-democratic social movement environment is, where is the grassroots? Because all of the organizations that are involved in criminal justice reform at the nation and most of the, at the nationwide and most of the state level receive funding from big philanthropy. And yes, that includes abolitionist organizations that say that we should get rid of police and get rid of prisons. They're also taking money from big philanthropy. So big philanthropy takes place in of also, and perhaps unremarkably, during this philanthropic capitalist shift. This is not, I'm not telling the story of this to make the argument that any of this is negative. Um, 
in a post-democratic environment, when you have low civic engagement, who is making the change? Also, mass incarceration was a phenomenon of the public sector. It was a phenomenon of legislators, and the prisons are mostly public. So it's not fair to say that the involvement of private industry is the problem here. So the hedge fund approach was brought by many of these uh, philanthropic capitalists who are involved in big philanthropy. In other words, you, um, you hedge your bets, you take uh, high levels of risk, and then you, you also uh, provide some buffer with more conservative advocacy. Um, there's an argument to be made that this is the role of philanthropy to take the risks that government can't make, kind of proof of concept. However, also with this infusion of money came the professionalization of the movement, or what's pejoratively known as, but I like it, so I'm gonna use it, um, the nonprofit industrial complex, where now you have people who make entire careers around reform, and so the, what is the purpose then? Is the purpose to keep the institution uh, running, or is it to make some type of significant change? A further question that I uh, encourage you to think about when you have this type of uh, movement is, is the tail wagging the dog. Um, if the change is coming from a very insular uh, group of people that largely agree, is it out of, out of touch with public opinion? And I think that one of the, the things that we'll, we'll see in the conclusion about what's happened since 2020 is yes, that big philanthropy was largely out of touch with uh, public opinion and not didn't anticipate the shifts that were to occur. And so the top-down approach is not always, especially for criminal justice reform, which has to do with crime and safety and these very um, evocative, visceral emotions or topics, you have to be careful about pressing forward change too much. The second stakeholder group that happened, uh, that were involved in the story of the First Step Act, but also in the story of criminal justice reform post-2000, were celebrities. And celebrity is very much involved in post-democratic politics because if you think about the idea that political change is made through overlapping networks of elites, well, a way to get to the elites often is not from you know, writing a letter to the president as a citizen, it's by getting someone who's high profile to come with you. And that's exactly what people did with the First Step Act. So Kim Kardashian, by the way, I knew, I knew nothing about like, what she did and I still didn't know, I read as little bit as possible because I don't want to know. But um, <laughs> Kim Kardashian, her husband obviously, Kanye West, a uh, big fan of Trump's and had access to the, uh, to the president. Kim Kardashian is also sometimes uh, social friends with Ivanka Trump. And they had met, I believe, at the Met Gala, which is completely a matter of post-democratic <laughs> politics. So Kim Kardashian um, was encouraged to bring Alice Marie Johnson, who uh, was incarcerated for a first time nonviolent drug offense and who would be benefited by the First Step Act. She was invited to the White House with Kim Kardashian to meet with Trump. And Trump was so moved by Alice Marie Johnson's story that he immediate, immediately tweeted out, oh, I don't have that picture. He immediately tweeted out a picture of himself with Kim Kardashian, said he had a great uh, meeting with Kim Kardashian, and he released Alice Marie Johnson. Um, the critics of Trump would say, of course, that Alice Marie Johnson's story had nothing to do with his decision later on to endorse the First Step Act. Um, perhaps it was Kim Kardashian, perhaps it was neither of them, perhaps he thought it was just politically expedient. However, Nevertheless, this was, um, this was a factor. Kim Kardashian was also involved with 50 other celebrities who were organized by the coalition that came together to pass the First Step Act, to sign a letter to Congress, because who do you, who to listen to but Alyssa Milano and Kim Kardashian when you're making political decisions? Um, why not, I suppose? But um, one interesting study that uh, I could provide the citation to more. Um, was that o Oprah's endorsement of Obama led to one million votes, additional one million votes. So how much are celebrities uh, important in post-democracy 
arguably, they get attention. So, so what is celebrity capital, in a way? So capital is very involved in post-democracy, but how is celebrity capital involved? Well, celebrity capital, capital is unique because it's fungible. Attention is a fungible quality that can be translated into political, social, symbolic, and economic different types of capital. So obviously the political capital of celebrities was activated in the passage of the First Step Act. Um, celebrities such as Alyssa, Alyssa Milano were tweeting out about the First Step Act. Um, it has social capital and providing for mainstreamization. It now becomes something that's de-risked, that's part of uh, ordinary conversations. So it's symbolic. I think that plays into the idea of mainstreamization. If Kim Kardashian, who I think does makeup, right? Someone can tell me, we're the young people, right? So she, um, it's symbolic of a change, ubiquity, but also economic. And the next group of stakeholders we'll talk about, talks about the uh, economic capital that they, that they bring. So on the left is Alyssa Milano. Um, interestingly, and I make this argument in relation to celebrity, and its influence on post-democratic social movements, but the influence on celebrity was not only to advance the social movement, but the social movement began to seek celebrity. And this is part of the problem of non-profitization, uh, the nonprofit industrial complex. So if you look on the picture of the right, um, you have Robert Downey Jr. and Sean Penn who spent some time in jail and so they were used. But if you look at the way they're positioned, next to formerly incarcerated activists on your Right? The formerly incarcerated activists are celebritized. And when criminal justice reform becomes a profession, obviously being a celebrity within your profession carries its benefits for social, social and economic mobility. Danny Trejo was also involved on that. So I make this point here. I'm sorry, uh, this is copyrighted, I'll be sued. Um, but this is an example of a nonprofit in 2022 um, that had its gala, this concerns criminal justice reform, gala at Hollywood American Legion in Los Angeles, California. You'll notice the red carpet. <laughs> so they try to imitate um, Hollywood. In fact, oftentimes Hollywood celebrities, um, Felicity Huffman, Natalie Portman have been involved in New Way of Life. So celebrities and nonprofit leaders becoming celebritized economic capital. So the third stakeholder group are corporations, were corporations. Remember that it, one of the reasons why mainstreamization, why criminal justice reform changed post 2000, what created the fertile grounds for criminal justice reform was that you had a very tight labor market. Prior to this, corporations really were, and I spoke to one of my purchasers, and she said like, Corporations would say, we'll do what you, we'll, we'll try to do what you want, but please don't give us any publicity around it. Like, we don't, we don't wanna be associated with this type of thing. And so businesses would contract with prisons to provide some type of work within the prison, but usually it was because of the cheap <laughs> 14 cents an hour prison rate. It's not like post-incarceration corporations were involved. However, it speaks to the low salience of crime, the tight labor market, um, and also the mainstreamization that has become de-risked. That corporations became involved in a big way um, post-2000. Post um, in speaking with those who were behind the First Step Act, corporate leaders such as within Coke played a major role. Coke was involved for about four years in the passage of the First Step Act in its earliest iterations. Um, Verizon got behind the First Step Act the um, US Chamber of Commerce got behind the First Step Act. There was an influx or um, also private prisons supported the First Step Act, which is a little bit contradictory until you realize that private prisons saw in advance that incarceration was going out and reentry services were coming in. So they're looking at the next big thing. So the First Step Act and the involvement of uh, business leaders the Business Roundtable also endorsed it. Um, Jamie Dimon was a big part of that support. This came about with a change in the ethos of corporations 
towards um, people who were formerly incarcerated. A lot because of necessity, but also because of a changing ethos. And so I put there the US Chamber of Commerce has, was involved with the First Step Act, but also has been supportive of second chance initiatives, trying to get people who are incarcerated back to work, eliminate the stigma, and so forth. Um, the Second Chance Business Coalition itself was established after uh, the First Step Act, also by Jamie Dimon, interesting, one of the, one of the leaders of this, but it involved 30 blue, uh, blue chip companies who were committed to the radical idea, radical, if you think about like, if in the 1990s, if you would have said these major corporations would be behind you know, felons coming out and being seated next to uh, law-abiding citizens um, to provide uh, best, to share best practices, getting people back to, back to work and ending stigma. So just two examples um, on your right. JP Morgan, I thought this was interesting. It's like I was just scrolling around and I saw their entire ad, so I screenshotted it. Um, so about 10% of Chase's um, employee roster right now is formerly incarcerated people. I asked, well, how many of these have committed violent crimes? And they kind of laughed and said, uh, well, we don't want bank robbers in a bank. So, <laughs> so like that's a cop out, but anyway. Um, but there are other companies that have really done more than just ban the box and make some type of in a superficial gesture at bringing people who have a, D, you know, a DWI back to work. So Nehemiah was featured by the Wall Street Journal. It's kind of a, a, a case study. Also, um, Dave's Killer Bread, any fans? Very, thank you, very good, very dense, right? Delicious bread, okay. So <laughs> Dave's Killer Bread, Nehemiah, and again, this harkens to what I was mentioning before about the language of redemption. Nehemiah is a biblical figure. Nehemiah Manufacturing, who makes sun and earth products, you're a lot of soap, um, not only provides opportunities such as we'll hire you, but also they provide reentry ho some um, housing at a reduced cost to people who are coming out of prison. They provide social work, social workers who are on site, and they are really at the forefront, the private sector at the forefront of testing out models of how to get people who don't have a college education, most of the people who come out of prison who haven't maybe have been institutionalized, um, who are not familiar with technology, how do we get these people back to work in a meaningful way? So Nehemiah uh, is a model of that. Economic capital was marshaled. As I mentioned at the beginning, one of the large changes post-2000 was the structural, in addition to the cultural changes that occurred. And you saw this in national advocacy groups, uh, non-governmental organizations on the left and the right who came together. As I mentioned, this is not a very kumbaya story. It's kumbaya in the end. Um, I have lots of images here from their, their uh, campaigns to make the point that you need ideologically resonant stories to appeal to a wide coalition of people. And so if you look at the photo on your left, it's from the American Civil Liberties Union. There was the conflation of uh, mass incarceration. You notice that the people were represented, African Americans, also the use of prison capital. They associated capitalism and uh, kind of right-leaning ideology with the problem of mass incarceration, which I think is nonsense. Um, and so they, they were formulating very aggressive goals of reducing the prison, uh, the incarceration rate by 50%. This number was repeated by many on the left, 50%, cut 50, which I mentioned at the beginning was behind the First Step Act. It was called cut 50 for that reason. Just, just Leadership USA also had the number of 50. On the other hand, you had the American Conservative Union, um, which was talking about public safety and the benefit of, to taxpayers, uh, protecting liberty and maintaining human dignity. So more conservative arguments. On the left, again, similar to the, uh, the ACLU that I just showed, this is Critical Resistance, which is an abolitionist nationwide organization, which also takes money from big philanthropy. But anyway, um, and so they argue that abolition is essential, essential, dismantle the prison industrial complex. On the right, just to finish the point, is Prison Fellowship, was, which was established by Chuck Colson, 
who was uh, involved in the Watergate scandal, right? He came out a born again Christian and became heavily involved. One of the, one of the actual like um, pioneers of a nationwide and international movement actually was rooted in um, Christian redemption. So you see this comes from Prison Fellowship, which also established Second Chance Month, which is in April to coincide with Easter and the idea of resurrection and rebirth. So bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Now, how did these people come together to very different messages <laughs> to uh, pass the First Step Act? Well, those private conversations that were happening because Doug Deason and Jared Kushner invited them, um, it wasn't as smooth as the photo that I showed you at the beginning of the lecture made out. There were major differences in the use of language and in the advocacy of these organizations. Those who were on the left, predictably, perhaps thought that the bill did not go far enough, that it largely ignored um, black and brown people and their unique history with the criminal justice movement. Um, they thought that it was a, a cover for Trump and that, that uh, in fact, we should, not, we should not pass it until we have something, have something better. So um, the Leadership Coalition for Civil and Human Rights, which is a large group of advocacy groups, primarily on the left, exclusively on the left, excuse me, they released a statement in summer of 2018 that said, we will mark anyone who votes for this bill as going against civil rights. <laughs> the reason they did that was because of what I had mentioned. They felt it didn't go far enough. And at the time, the bill had left out sentencing reform. It was only focused on corrections, but wasn't going to touch mandatory minimums. So they held out. And in fact, when the bill went through the House, the Leadership Council for Civil and Human Rights voted those who had voted for the First Step Act as voting against civil rights. Yeah. <laughs> this created massive amounts of controversy, uh, acrimony within the advocacy community. Some would say that it's, it, was, it, was, it disrupted it irrevocably. Um, but this played out similar to what I was arguing about post-democracy and how it's, it's networks of elites that make political change. Those who were arguing in favor of the First Step Act, someone uh, from Cut 50 brought a member of the Leadership Council of Civic and Human Rights on a hike. And they went to literally like went to the top of the mountain, had a chat about it, and she said, I will support the First Step Act if it includes corrections reform. They came down off the mountain. There were many email conversations that happened. Corrections, uh, sentencing reform was on the table. Donald Trump got behind it. Eventually, the bill contained both corrections and sentencing reform. The left-leaning groups were adequately satisfied, and the bill passed. One of the lessons that they say they drew from this was that in reaching out to their own constituencies, it was a mistake to try to use the language of the other side, that they had to meet people where they were, and if they did not, that it would immediately um, raise red flags and there was distrust. The last group that I'm going to talk about before looking to the future about what, what we can make of uh, post-democratic social movements and what this means for criminal justice reform is the final stakeholder group is formerly incarcerated people. Um, in the photo of the First Step Act, as I mentioned, you had formerly incarcerated activists who were at the head of that movement. As I mentioned, Chuck Colson, who Nick, uh, under Nixon, he was one of the first right-leaning uh, organizational leaders to get involved in reform. But prior to the 2000s, he was really uh, an outlier. It was mostly professional people from upper middle class backgrounds who were leading this movement. You began to see that shift also in the early 2000s when President George W. Bush brought a formerly incarcerated person up on stage with him or pointed to him and had him tell a story when he was uh, talking about the Second Chance Act. Alice Marie Johnson is there next to Donald Trump. She's the person who he granted clemency and who moved, who arguably moved the needle on the First Step Act. 
if everyone remembers Bernie Carrick, Bernie Carrick, a New York City police commissioner, also spent time in prison. He was at the Oval Office, formerly incarcerated, and used his power to advocate for the bill. Uh, Davis Safavian is on the bottom right, the head of the American Conservative Union's Nolan Center for Justice, also was incarcerated as a fallout of the Jack Abramoff scandal. And they felt that they were personally um, motivated and they made a bigger impact because they were able to relate their first person lived experience to others who may not have that type of experience. On the left, you had uh, formerly incarcerated activists like Topeka Sam from Ladies of Hope Ministry who were involved, who brought their personal story to try to tip that. And so formerly incarcerated people have been sought out for positions of leadership on this issue, but the, the concern is that they are being used in very selective fashion, that those who already have political and social connections, such as Carrick and Safavian, are the ones who have access to the ears of people like Donald Trump and who also disproportionately benefit from having that access because they were all granted clemency by Trump, including Jared Kushner's father, by the way. But does this mean that we should dismiss that because ultimately it was their advocacy that led to the passage of the First Step Act too? So very complicated questions with no easy answers. Um, before I leave or before we open up for, for questions, um, I was finishing up the book uh, in 2020. And at the time, it seemed like advocates on the left and the right saw this as a moment of unprecedented, it was like a bull run market, that the laws of economics no longer applied, that we were headed towards a new era where incarcerate, that we would see in a more enlightened fashion uh, incarceration, and that we'd be headed, maybe it would take a while, but we would be headed towards less incarceration, more alternatives to our incarceration, more opportunities. Support for reform, including police reform, was at an all-time high prior to June of 2020. In June of 2020, of course, um, George Floyd's murder happened, which led to uh, the largest uh, flood of people out into the streets that the country has ever witnessed. It was estimated that 10% of the American population participated in some protest related to the George Floyd incident. Um, but Americans also, during that apex of support, moments immediately after, saw scenes of urban unrest, of violence, of looting that cost in the billions of dollars. And the homicide rate went from being at historic lows to being at historic, not historic highs, but uh, highs that were unseen. Since the 1990s, there was an increase of about 30%. And so it went up dramatically. An icy wind descended upon the reform community. And the question was raised, it was an icy wind. <laughs> um, and this was repeated in many op-eds, is criminal justice reform dead? Okay. So, under the post-democratic movement, one of the biggest criticisms was that, primarily on the left, because there was funding for language that advocated for the most avant-garde messaging possible, that they used language of abolish and defund during this period. Uh, Mariam Kaba wrote a piece from the New York Times around that time that said, yes, when we mean abolish the police, we literally mean abolish the police. It's not like, you know, reimagine, redirect funds, better educate the police, like just get rid of it. Um, so this is a, a poll from about that time. So the defund the police movement uh, was extraordinarily unpopular, <laughs> continues to be extraordinarily unpopular. I would argue that it single-handedly set the movement back 10 years. Um, however, there was generally uh, support, continued support for various common sense reforms not only to the police, but to other forms of um, criminal justice reform. I argue that there is reason for optimism, but also caution 
under this mainstreamed movement that is occurring during a period of post-democracy. One is purely numbers. Um, so if you look at 2021, the number had skyrocketed, right, from in post-2020, post went up to 6.8. The high was uh, in 1990-10. And remember, also in the 1930s, it was 10. But the estimate is projected to go down. Homicide rates have already gone down, and demographic shifts projected uh, fewer, fewer young men, less crime in general, fewer homicides. So if we have low salience of crime, if we continue to have tight labor market, we, we predict that after this kind of inter, you know, intervention in criminal justice for poor movement, there is some reason for optimism. However, there is also a moment of caution that in spite of the fact that we now have a nationalized movement infrastructure, as I mentioned, in spite of the fact that we now have funding, as I mentioned, in spite of the fact that we now have corporations that are on board and are continuing, the, the Second Chance Business Coalition didn't cease its work post-2020. We have corporations on board. We have formerly incarcerated people who are, who are taking leadership positions and so forth. We have celebrities who continue to endorse reform in spite of there being still uh, opioid overuse and white Americans and middle-class Americans, if you will, saying that we have an issue with especially drug war and there seems to be support for legalizing drugs more and more, so the culture is changing. There is caution that's related to the post-democratic impulse to have change driven by uh, kind of a, a vacuum, a hermetically sealed group of elites that are out of touch with public opinion. And that is why I put up this graph that if you see the Americans' call for tougher criminal justice um, was rather dramatic uh, post-2020. Post it went from being at an all-time low since the early 90s, only 50% said that um, it's not tough enough, which is still pretty high, very punitive. Um, <laughs> but it went up to 58%. So I think that when we're talking about criminal justice reform, you have to keep in mind that in the American system, particularly Europeans are more isolated uh, or more insulated against changes to public opinion because their criminal justice system is not uh, driven by the electorate as much as ours is, that there also always has to be with social movements, if we want to call it that, a finger on the pul pulse of the American public because in the absence of that, in the absence of mass support, in the absence of some type of civic engagement, criminal justice reform will be dead. Thank you.